Today's lesson is about bacteria. As you watch this podcast, you're going to fill out the guided notes that your teacher has given you. Make sure that you pause so that you can write the material down. Also, you'll find this entire PowerPoint on the online gradebook. Bacteria unicellular prokaryotes. A prokaryote is a unicellular organism that does not have a nucleus or membrane-bound organelles. Fossils date bacteria back 3.5 billion years. Scientists believe that they were the first forms of life. They were anaerobic, which means they can live without oxygen, autotrophic, which means they can make their own food. So how are bacteria classified? Although once classified into a single large bacterial kingdom called Monera, bacteria are now divided into two separate kingdoms. Archaebacteria, or ancient bacteria, adapted to harsh environments. Their cell walls do not contain peptoglycan. Types of archaebacteria. Thermocidophiles. Thermo means heat, acidio means acid, and phile means to love. They live in hot, acidic places like hot springs. Other ones are like halophiles. They're salt lovers. They live in water with high salt concentrations like the Great Salt Lake and Dead Sea. Methogens live in oxygen-free habitats like mud of swamps and bogs, and they produce a really smelly gas called methane. So how are bacteria classified? Well, another classification is eubacteria, or true bacteria, the most numerous and diverse group. They live everywhere, in the air, water, soil, and even in our bodies. Their cell walls are made of peptoglycan, which is a protein sugar. The reason why scientists decided to split the kingdom Monera is they discovered that some bacteria had peptoglycan while others did not. So where do you bacteria live? Well, they're found in every habitat on Earth. Soil, water, air, skin, even in the colon. So how big are bacteria? Well, all are microscopic. They're measured in units called micrometers, and they can range from 0.2 to 500 micrometers. Bacteria come in three shapes. Coccus, which means cocci, or round, or spherical. Bacillus, rod shape. Sprilius, a spiral shape. When we name bacteria, we name them based on their shape and then also named on their grouping. The grouping can be staphylo, which means clusters, strepto, single file strands, and diplo, which means pairs. So if you've ever had strep throat, you had streptococcus. Can you name that bacteria? Bacterial cell structures. All bacteria cells have a cell wall, cell membrane, cytoplasm, DNA, one circular chromosome. Even though the diagram on the right, the DNA is hard to kind of see that it's circular, it is. It's just twisted. Ribosomes, which you remember, make proteins. Some bacteria also have flagella, a long whip-like locomotive tail, pili, which can be used to exchange between cells and can also help bacteria stick to surfaces. And a capsule, a protective layer of polysaccharides, which is like a starchy sugar, outside the cell wall. So how do bacteria stick to surfaces? Well, it's a net of polysaccharides which can help them stick to surfaces like teeth and handles and skin. So how do bacteria get the nutrition? Well, they can be heterotrophic, which means they use food produced by other organisms, like saprophytes, which feed on dead and decaying organisms. Autotrophic, they produce their own food from inorganic matter. They can be photoautotrophs, which use sunlight as energy source, like a plant. Or they can be chemoautotrophs, which they use chemical reactions as an energy source. 
So how do bacteria respire? How do they breathe? Well, some don't. They're obligate anaerobes. They cannot survive in the presence of oxygen, like methogens, syphilis, tetanus, botulism. They could be obligate aerobes, which means they require oxygen, like the bacteria that ca cause tuberculosis, which infects the lung tissue. Facultative anaerobes, which can live with or without oxygen, like E. coli. So which types of these uh, do you believe could have an adaptive advantage? If you said facultative anaerobes, you'd be right. So bacteria reproduce in three ways. Binary fission, which is asexual. A bacterium replicates its chromosome and splits in half. Parents and both daughter cells are gen genetically identical. One drawback is anything that can kill one can kill the entire population because they're all clones. Conjugation. Two genetically different bacterial cells come together to form a pili. A piece of DNA is exchanged through the pilus, and the advantage is increases genetic variability. And what we can see with this is that bacteria will actually exchange a resistance to an antibiotic. Transformation. A live cell picks up DNA from a dead cell and begins to express it. Since its DNA changes, its phenotype changes. The knowledge of how this reproduction happens helped scientists with their DNA biotechnology. Um, and we'll talk about it later on, but this gave us an understanding of what we can do to, for example, make a fish glow. But most importantly, it was to insert, for example, the DNA information to produce insulin into bacterial cells so we can make insulin for diabetics. So how do bacteria harm cells? Some produce toxins, the poisons that disrupt an organism's metabolism. And there are two types of toxins. An endotoxin found in the cells of gram-negative bacteria. Symptoms are fever and weakness and circulatory damage like typhoid fever. Others are exotoxins. They produce product, rather, of bacterial metabolism screened in the, into the areas surrounding the bacterium. These are the most poisonous toxins and can be destroyed by heat. Now, gram-negative positive is just basically what substances are in their cell wall and how they're stained with uh, different um, dyes. Uh, endotoxins are produced by tetanus and diphtheria and botulism. I suggest that you pause the vodcast and read about some toxins and their mode of interference. Adaptation survival. When conditions are poor, many bacteria will encase their DNA and some cytoplasm into a tough protective envelope called an endospore, which can remain dormant for years until conditions improve. Example of this is anthrax, which is a fatal disease in sheep and cattle. The endospore can survive 60 years. So how do we treat bacterial infections? Antibiotics. They're chemicals capable of inhibiting growth in some bacteria. Many are produced by living organisms. They destroy both useful and pathogenic, which means disease-causing bacteria. And they work by weakening the cell walls. When it does that, water will rush in and cause cytolysis, which just means rupture of the cell. Bacteria that survive can become resistant to antibiotics. So what was the first antibiotic? It was penicillin, a product of the fungus penicillium, and was discovered by Alexander Fleming. So what can we do to slow down antibiotic resistance? We can take your antibiotics as directed. You finish prescription even if you're feeling better, and this will help prevent antibiotic resistance. Disease-causing bacteria. Tuberculosis, strep throat, salmonella, botulism, tetanus. These are just to name a few. Most bacteria are harmless or beneficial. Bacteria that help us digest our food, like E. coli, naturally fertilize the soil, like rhizobium, process foods like cheese, yogurt, vinegar, sour cream, and pickles, treat sewage, mine minerals from the earth and decompose dead organisms. The most important is recycled matter within the biosphere. 
that's the end of our podcast. And I hope that you have a great day.